One of the most practical, though it also turns out to be somewhat crude, way of writing down and working with elements of an algebraic structure is to specify them using an alphabet of letters that stick together to make words and to provide a set of rules that tell you how to simplify and reduce one word to have another form. This is called the generators and relations viewpoint of group theory. And what we're going to do in this video is give you a brief introduction to how generators and relations work along with an example motivated by anagrams. So I like to think of generators and relations as giving us kind of the nouns and the verbs in order to make an algebraic structure. The generators kind of serve as the nouns, the building blocks that we can build our elements out of. And the relations kind of give us a set of verbs, a set of relationships between those generators that we can then use to color out our algebraic structure. One example is to think about the symmetries of a square. There are eight different symmetries that a square has, and three of them turn out to have the flavor of a rotation, so a 90 degree rotation, a 180, a 270. And the other four of them, that are not the identity, are reflections across some axis of symmetry. But when we actually go to write these things down in an abstract structure, we very often write them using only two letters. They're all built out of R's, which are sort of my basic rotation by 90 degrees, and then also T's, which are a single basic reflection that I single out. And every other element in this structure is expressible as some combination, composition, of those T's and those R's. And so the T's and the R's are kind of like our building blocks. We're going to call them generators. A set of generators for a group is a subset of its elements, the rest of the group of which is expressible just in terms of those elements. So it's, it's a bit like saying T and R are the generators of this symmetry group of the square, because as soon as I have T and R in my group, I therefore also have every power of T, every power of R, and every product of a power of T with a power of R. And in fact, all the elements in my symmetry group are expressible as some power of T multiplied by some power of R. So that's what makes T and R generators for the dihedral group of the square. So R and T are going to be what we call generators for this group, because every element can be expressed using just R and T. But that's not enough information, because we also don't know how R and T interact with one another and how they interact with the identity element in my group. So we need a little bit more information. That information comes from what we call the relations for this group. And a relation is nothing more than an expression. It's like a word built out of my alphabet of generators. And it's a word that we have decided is equal to the identity element in my group. So another way to think about what these uh, relations are is that they're trivial words. They're combinations of letters that as soon as I see them in an expression, I can cancel them out because they just reduce down to the identity. So what might be examples of relations in the symmetry group of a square? Well, we first might think about the rotation by 90 degrees. If we do that rotation four times in succession, the result is a rotation by 360 degrees, which is otherwise known as an identity symmetry for my group. So r to the fourth power in the structure is equal to the identity element. And that gives me one trivial word. Anytime I see four r's in a row in a, a word written with these two letters, I know that I can just cross out those four r's and write identity instead. The same thing is true for my reflection. If I do a reflection of my square and then I do that same reflection again, I get back to the identity once again. And so t squared will also equal the identity element. So anytime I see a t next to another t in a word written using this alphabet of generators, I know I can just cancel that out and write identity. So these types of relations I like to call order relations. They just sort of tell me how an element's powers interact with itself and therefore interact with the identity. Right? How many powers of my generator do I need before I come back around to the identity, if that ever happens? And in this case, it happens after four powers for r, and it happens after two powers for t. But that by itself is not enough either, because these elements, these generators, also interact with one another, because after all, t multiplied by r and r multiplied by t, for example, are not the same element in my symmetry group for the square. So we need some more relations that might help to tell us how that interaction happens. For example, if I do rotation first followed by reflection, r followed by t, it turns out that's the same thing that I get if I do the reflection first, t, and then I do the opposite rotation, r inverse or r to the third power, if you love. So rt and tr cubed are the same element in this group. 
And that's what I like to call an interaction relation. It tells me a bit about how these elements, these generators R and T, commute or don't commute. And in this example, they don't. RT is not the same as TR. In fact, RT is equal to TR cubed. We can rewrite this as a relation, a trivial word, just by multiplying all of my elements over to one side of this equation. So I could, for example, multiply both sides by t, since the t is going to cancel that t, and get trt equals r cubed. I can then multiply on the right by another r to turn this into r to the fourth, and therefore the identity. And when I do that, I re-express this relation as trtr equals identity, or if you like, tr the quantity squared is equal to the identity. So what we get here is a list of three trivial words, three things that when I see them in a word spelled out in this alphabet of generators, I know I can just cancel and rewrite as an identity element. And so a presentation for the symmetry group of the square consists of the generators R and T, so that's my alphabet, and the three trivial words R to the fourth, T to the second, and the quantity TR to the second. It turns out, and you'd have to prove this more rigorously than I'm doing today, that this is a complete description of the symmetry group of a square. So what does this look like in practice when we want to start applying this to the, the anagrams and the braids and the other stuff that we're learning about in our course this semester? Let's shift gears and look at how we can implement a presentation of generators and relations for the group of permutations to help us to simplify an algebraic expression written with the generators of a permutation group. I want to do that by looking at a single anagram that anagram which turns the four-letter word plum into the four-letter word lump. And I want to write it using two different braidograms, two different combinations of adjacent transpositions that take me from plum to lump. And I want to be able to use the algebraic relationships between those transpositions to explain why those two words actually give me the same element in my permutation group. So on the one hand, I could turn plum into lump through a relatively complicated sequence of adjacent transpositions. I could trade the third and fourth position first. I'm going to call that the generator sigma 3. And then after that, I could trade the first and second positions, which I'm going to call the generator sigma 1, followed by trading the second and third, which is what we're going to call sigma 2, third and fourth, which is sigma 3, and second and third again. If you trace these strands from beginning to end, you'll see that that relatively complicated sequence of adjacent transpositions takes us from plum into lump. Of course, it's not the only way to do it. There is, in fact, a much simpler way to do it, using fewer transpositions, just by first transposing the first and second, that's sigma 1, then the second and third, sigma 2, then the third and fourth, sigma 3. So that gives me these two different words that I can spell using the alphabet of adjacent transpositions, sigma 1 being the transposition of 1 with 2, sigma 2 being the transposition of 2 with 3, sigma 3 being the transposition of 3 with 4. One of the words has five letters in for my alphabet in it. The other word has only three letters for my alphabet in it. And yet, these both represent the same permutation, that which changes plum into lump. So two different words representing the same element. Deciding whether or not two words in a presentation of a group represent the same element of that group is a very difficult problem in general. It's called the word problem for a group presentation. And in fact, the word problem for groups is unsolvable with any efficient algorithm. So I can't even tell a computer how to do this process that we're about to do in some sort of cookbook fashion. Such an algorithm has been proven not to exist. So this is, in general, a very unwieldy way to work with groups in general, but it has a lot of utility for us in the simple cases we're going to look at this semester. So let's look at how the algebraic structure of how the generators, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, interact with one another explains that, in fact, these two words, even though they look different, actually are representations of the same permutation. How does the algebra tell this story of equality? To answer that question, we need to know what are the relations between these adjacent transpositions, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Those relations are defined by what's called the Coxeter presentation for the group of permutations. The Coxeter presentation's relations come in these three different flavors. The first flavor are my order relations. It tells me that each of those adjacent transpositions is an order 2 element. Each one of them would undo itself if we did it twice in succession. 
The second is a commutation relation. It tells me that if I have two transpositions that are disjoint from one another, so sigma 1 and sigma 3 here are disjoint because they're not operating on the same strand at any point. right? Sigma 1 transposes first with second. Sigma 3 transposes third with fourth. So they're not competing for the same strand. And for that reason, they commute with one another. Sigma 1 followed by sigma 3 gives me the same permutation as if I had done sigma 3 followed by sigma 1, because they're not enmeshed with one another at all. So this second relation is a commutation relation for disjoint adjacent transpositions. And then the last equations tell us what to do with permutations, transpositions that do share a strand. And these are called sometimes the skein relations. Um, and they're a little bit more complex. So we just sort of look at them and say, sigma 1 and sigma 2 interact in this fashion. 1, 2, 1 is the same as 2, 1, 2. And the adjacent 2, 3, 2 interact in the same way also. 2, 3, 2 is the same as 3, 2, 3. And it turns out that this is a complete specification of the relations necessary to define the group of permutations on four symbols using the generators sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, which are the adjacent transpositions of strands. Whew. OK. So if you buy that that's a presentation for this group, how can we use that algebraic reality to tell the story that, in fact, these two very different looking bradygrams are actually achieving the same permutation of plum into lump? Let's just start with the more complicated permutation over here on the left. Sigma 3, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 2. Using the associativity property that we have in any group, we can group together these last three factors, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 2. And focusing on them, we find that this is one side of one of the equations in my skein relations. Namely, 2, 3, 2 gives us the same permutation as 3, 2, 3. And we can use that to replace, in my expression, the quantity sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 2 with the quantity sigma 3, sigma 2, sigma 3. So all we had to do was use that skein relation to make a substitution. Instead of 2, 3, 2, we want 3, 2, 3. Now let's look again at this. What is another substitution we could make? Well, what we see here is that sigma 3 and sigma 1 are now next to each other, and those are disjoint transpositions. Therefore, we have this commutation relation. Sigma 1, sigma 3 is equal to sigma 3, sigma 1. So anywhere I saw a sigma 1, sigma 3 in my word, I could replace it if I wanted to with sigma 3, sigma 1 instead. Again, using associativity, we could group those two together and then make that replacement sigma 3, sigma 1 instead of sigma 1, sigma 3. Finally, after all this machination, we now have a sigma 3 next to a sigma 3. And we have a relation for that, too. One of these first relations that tells us about the orders of the generators, namely sigma 3 followed by another sigma 3, sigma 3 squared, is in fact just an identity permutation. So if I group that sigma 3 with that sigma 3, I can take that combination and just cross it out, cancel it. It's equal to the identity permutation. And so I don't need to see it there at all. It's just an invisible product. And at the end of that whole process, I have arrived at sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, which is exactly the word that looked simpler and is represented by this simpler bradygram on the right side of my diagram. So the generators and relations viewpoint of a group lets you use the building block generators and the relations which tell us how those generators can combine together to make trivial words that we can cancel to be able to do algebra. And being able to show using just the algebraic properties that two words are in fact equal gives us this nice verification that the two different pictures that we saw when we drew these two different bradygrams in fact represented the same element in the algebraic structure that we're trying to study. And any time we use this viewpoint, we want to be able to take both of those perspectives. How does the geometry of the braid diagram or the knot or the rational tangle or whatever, how does that tell a story of sameness? But then also, how is that story of sameness reflected in the algebra that we're using to represent these objects too?